Cool. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Stefano Maffulli. I'm director of community at Scality, which is a startup that uh, has been doing large-scale deployments of storage systems for about 10 years. But we are today to, here to talk about multi-cloud native world and how data affects developing and deploying applications in these environments. And to get started, I want to give a little bit of a uh, fact. Like every enterprise user, every corporation is using multiple clouds. That, that's a fact. It's been, uh, it's been around for a while. We've been talking about it, like the right scale analysis of the state of the cloud yearly shows these numbers growing up with uh, multiple usage of, of uh, different clouds. Um, when OpenStack started, I used to work at the OpenStack Foundation. We, we've been talking about multiple clouds run by the same uh, underlying layer using sharing the same APIs. Uh, and uh, there is even a page under the, the documentation uh, of, of OpenStack talking about multi-cloud, multiple OpenStack clouds with one, with one device. And we're hearing the same story repeated nowadays with the cloud native world at the Cloud Native Foundation talking about Kubernetes where it's this magical world where your, your application runs seamlessly in the same way whether, wherever they are deployed as long as the Kubernetes APIs below are the same. And with that in mind, I was always amazed when um, um, the problem when I hear this story, because I started looking more into details about what happened. So, you know, the story is very common where you have multiple applications, then there is infrastructure uh, defined as code with any of these, any tool like Ansible, Terraform, Chef, and Puppet, or any other. And these, these tools, they allow for ab abstracting to some extent what the infrastructure below is. And, um, and applications can run in any cloud. But looking more into details, this means that the applications run into silos, like the application for Amazon is written and is deployed on Amazon. Another application is deployed on Azure. So when we talk about multi-cloud, we're basically hearing multiple clouds running at the same time. So one corporation having accounts on each of these, on each of these clouds. And, um, the, the dream of portability um, is, not really, uh, is not really true, or, or it's not really that simple, even if you use very basic primitives, especially when you start keeping um, when, uh, data into the equation. Like when you have applications that are not just simply stateless applications, but they need uh, access to, to data, then having them spanning across multiple, multiple clouds and multiple different infrastructures um, becomes becomes very complicated, and that doesn't really change with Kubernetes in the picture, um, it, because the problems with uh, keep on getting even bigger as as you add more data, and the, the the silos become even more heavy, and it becomes even more physically complicated, uh, let alone expensive to have applications that can be moved or migrated from one place to another. And on top of that, there is another place, another issue that starts becoming more visible is the lack of visibility about your data. Where is it sitting? How much is it costing? Why is it costing that much? Uh, who has access to it? So security, reliability start to, start to become bigger problems when you have applications spanning multiple clouds and multiple systems. So in the cloud native world, we hear the story that Kubernetes can fix that. Because, um, well, first of all, application development has become faster. Like, there is no question about it that, that applications running on top of Kubernetes, or maybe one of the main advantages of Kubernetes, and probably one of the reasons why its, it's uh, adoption has skyrocketed as so fast, is that Application, uh, application developers love it. You, do can, you, you can, if, uh, in fact, develop your application on your laptop, test it on your laptop, and then the same application deploy seamlessly in your own managed Kubernetes, unmanaged Kubernetes, or, or AKS, AKS, or any, any of the other uh, Kubernetes clusters. There is, there is a lot of automation that is available. 
Um, but but um, and and uh, in in that um, we think that the object storage story is one that we don't talk or we don't hear enough in the cloud native world. Um, a lot of the conversations around uh, CSI, the, the cloud storage interface, inside Kubernetes, they all revolve around block and file. Applications all the time, uh, even with, regardless whether they're deployed on infrastructure as a service like, uh, like OpenStack or Kubernetes, when we hear conversations about this, we always hear the reference to uh, uh, block and, and file. And instead, uh, we believe that the object storage model is a lot simpler. Um, and it fits perfectly with the Kubernetes metaphor. Because if you think about it, it's stateless, just like Kubernetes and pod model um, supposed to be. Uh, the location is ab abstract. Uh, it's just a URL for your, for your data. And uh, it, it's, it's a good way to separate concerns, uh, uh, the operation, operational concerns. You don't have to worry about capacity planning when you're thinking about your, your application. It's extremely predictable. There, you don't have to manage the locking or state management. And um, it is uh, super optimized for heterogeneous networks. If you think about it, it's uh, multi-cloud and geo-distributed by nature, an object, uh, the object protocol. And um, it's powered by metadata, where multiple clusters um, scattered around object carry metadata that allow you to find them uh, wherever they are. So the question for me is whether we're talking enough about object storage inside a cloud native world or whether we are leaving one larger piece of the picture by focusing on block and files. So trying to adapt uh, a metaphor that is not really native. And that's where we um, developed Zenko. Thinking about this, uh, Zenko is a multi-cloud data controller that manages uh, uh, workflows across multiple data, and especially uh, unstructured data. So focusing on objects that, um, that are native to the cloud. Um, it's a single unified API. Uh, and it's, it's an open source project uh, that speaks S3 and allows you to abstract whatever happens on the back end. So really frees the developer's mind from having to keep track of where things are, where things can go, who has access to it. And on the high level view, the architecture of the application is a Kubernetes application, of course, where um, there is offer, it offers one Amazon S3 API, API um, on the front end. Then uh, the objects get passed to a storage location control that is capable of translating API calls between different, different uh, storage solutions like Amazon S3, Blob, um, uh, Azure Blob Storage, and GCP Storage, Cloud Storage. Offers also a transient cache, data cache, that it allows you to save money when you're doing replication between different clouds. Like you can, you can set rules um, through that workflow manager that allow you to, to copy, make copies, or make um, um, set expiration policies um, and uh, uh, deletion of objects and stuff. Um, so that. Um, that simplifies your keeping track of your, of your cloud-native applications. And, um, and it also comes with a UI um, portal um, for, for managing all of that. And I'll give you an overview uh, in a minute. So the, the unified inf interface across the multiple clouds, I mean, carries a bunch of um, very, visible, very visible advantages. Because as a developer, you don't have to think about learning the differences between multiple multi-part uploads between GCP and S3 and, and blob storage. You just pick S3 and let the cloud server front end take care of it uh, as Zenko. Um, and your data is left untouched. That's a very important differentiator. So if you have legacy application or if you have separate application that still need to access your blob storage natively, and you can bypass the whole Zenko um, system and still get your data read. On the, it, it, is made, uh, it has a powerful metadata-driven component that allows you to 
um, fill in your, your knowledge about where things are. Um, and I'll give you an overview in a little bit. The, the metadata can be captured inbound as the objects get fed into Zenko, or can be uh, updated through notifications out of bound. So if you have existing clusters, existing uh, buckets, or uh, containers, then you can connect to those, also including file systems. We're working on that, supporting Ceph and uh, NFS and SMB. You can connect your existing storage devices and, uh, and get your metadata for those files ingested into Zenko. At that point, you have one comprehensive view of your, of your files, wherever they're sitting. Um, the policy-based data management allows you to act on those metadata. So you can define logs uh, to expire after three months or, and get moved into a cold storage location. Or you can, you can, use, uh, you can simultaneously upload in one uh, object and fed into a machine learning application running on GCP while keeping another copy for distribution inside a cheaper for example, bucket with a CDN that allows you for faster reaching your customers. And um, since it's based on Kubernetes, it can be deployed anywhere. We have tested it in uh, multiple, multiple environments. We have, um, for the enterprise version of Zenko, we support our distribution of Kubernetes, which, by, by the way, is also open source. It's called Metal Kates, Metal K8S. Um, but it can run in any other Kubernetes cluster seamlessly, and uh, ultimately offers you a single metadata namespace for wherever your data is sitting, globally distributed. So I'm going to use five minutes to give you an overview of what Zenko looks like in, uh, from the uh, UI perspective. So this is. This is a uh, demo environment that you can, you can try on your own uh, if you go to zenko.io and, uh, and log in with your Google credentials. It's very seamless. You can start a sandbox by clicking a button, and that will run for you a, a, Kuber, a Kubernetes uh, environment and uh, Zenko deployed on top. And then all you have to do to, to get a full experience is you, to connect to some storage um, outside of, of Zenko, like put your uh, AWS keys uh, to, to access uh, a bucket. And what I've done here, sorry, because I don't know. What I've done here is that I connected a couple of storage locations. So the default is the, the local sandbox uh, file system. Then I connected to AWS and uh, to Azure Blob. And, um, and I put some files in there. So um, I set some rules where everything that comes into the bucket called images on the Zenko local file system gets replicated into two locations. One is on AWS S3, and this other one is on Azure Blob Storage. The cool thing about this is that having a transient source uh, local means that I can do a an upload into both directions without having, basically having to pay. Like, as you know, the ingress fees are zero or almost zero, usually. And if I set the rule of replicas between AWS S3 and, and Azure, then my first upload will go into S3 for free, and then the transfer to, uh, to Azure would be expensive. I would be charged for it. And this is interesting when you, have a, when you have replications that need to go through something like disaster recovery or when, when you're thinking about having multiple copies in different, different places for safety reasons. Um, I also set up a very simple expiration policy on, on one of the buckets, saying that everything uh, that is in the bucket images gets archived, archived my older copies after one day. And I went on and um, uploaded a few pictures inside my images, images bucket. And um, for example, this one, I have it uploaded. And I put metadata 
in, in here, some metadata is automatically added by, by Zenko. And, and uh, I added manually the, the meta, metadata um, Amazon type, type equals mountain. And for something that was uh, shown in the, as an ocean picture instead, has a different metadata type, and that's type ocean. So this came to me uh, because we were doing demos with um, a machine learning systems with uh, uh, throwing images at a machine learning algorithm that recognizes what the main topic of the picture is, attaches a tag to the picture, and then throws it into Zenko. Um, and, uh, and so when I, went, when I go and try to do a search, I can search inside the images bucket, and I can do, oof. Oh. <laughs> Didn't save my um, All right, so if I type mountain, it finds me all my mountains pictures. If I type ocean, I find all my mountain pictures. Did I mistype something? Well, it worked. The the cool thing is that you have access also through um, API, and um, and you don't have to uh, you don't have to uh, use the UI only. Um, that metadata search is powered by MongoDB, so you can you can hit that endpoint straight directly. So what you can do with with Zenko is you 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 can save money, you can get faster to your customers. You, you can de develop applications that are cloud native with a uh, much faster way. And um, you can try it today. And on, if you go to www.zenko.io, and we're open for uh, questions also on the forums. That's pretty much it. <laughs> Any questions, doubts, complaints? Yes, yes, so it's native. Once you uh, ship it to, um, to the object inside the bucket, that gets replicated natively with uh, whatever the, the metadata uh, system is for AWS or Blob or GCP, Wasabi. It depends on the bucket. If you have versions, um, like, like I, I do in this, um, if you go to the dashboard, I can show you the differences in storage. But yeah, you, you can keep different versions. And, and uh, um, you can see here, there is a one megabyte archived, and, and two megabyte is the new stuff. And same goes into Azure and, and, and AWS. They have versions, because I've been playing with the same image. <laughs> Cool. Thank you.